So, uh, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, slightly more casual uh, session about the user interface. Um, the main goal of it is to be sort of, a, on the one hand, a bit of a retrospective on what we did in 2.8 in a bit more detail, but maybe more importantly also a discussion about uh, what are the next big goals and challenges and also how to um, you know, involve people in the best way possible, the community, other developers, and how we can also improve our process and our work uh, in the future. With me today, uh, my name is William, I, we have uh, Brecht van Lommel and uh, Pablo Vazquez, and uh, we, have, we have sort of uh, formed together with a few other people kind of a little bit of a UI group uh, for Blender 2.8, so we have what we call the UI team, and we sort of look at the schedule and the guidelines and the plans together. And we have, uh, we're in different places. Uh, there's Campbell as well in Australia, and we meet uh, every week on, uh, you know, with video conferencing and discuss what's going on. So we sort of uh, form a tiny, a little UI panel. And so it makes sense that we're uh, up here. Uh, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, go through in a bit more detail, uh, try to not take too long, and then I'd like to very much uh, ask you some questions about, as I said, our process and so on. So, um, first of all, I think it's interesting to talk about like the big picture rather than all the individual uh, detailed changes. Um, one of the things with uh, Blender that's interesting is thinking of ways to make it easier to use. Now, ease of use can sometimes have this connotation that it makes something also less powerful or slower or more stupid, but um, we're trying to think of ways to make things more approachable without you know, uh, making it you know, compromising on those things. So this is like an overall uh, goal of ours to try to broaden the appeal of Blender. And the other thing is um, there's a really big opportunity for, for Blender, which is uh, because it's so open and free and people can easily use it, download it, and contribute to it, um, we have an, uh, an awesome um, opportunity to become basically the default tool uh, used in schools and education um, because it's so practical that you can download it and use it so easily. If uh, Blender becomes slightly more approachable and it's becomes slightly easier to transition to and from Blender, we have the ability to sort of break the cycle where schools only will teach a certain app because studios use it and studios will only use a certain app because people coming out of schools will already know, uh, you know a certain tool. If we can sort of start to break that cycle a little bit by squeezing ourselves into schools and education, that can really help Blender, not only for those students, but for everyone, because it gets adopted more, we get more support, more, um, uh, more developers working on it. So improving the interface can have positive consequences outside of the interface as well. Um, um, the other thing is getting more uh, pros uh, on board and we've already seen what they were able to do with Blender on the next-gen uh, project, which shows that Blender is an amazingly powerful tool that has so many capabilities. Um, but uh, if it's slightly easier for studios to adopt, they might you know, uh, look at it uh, or be able to adopt it more easily. And that can have lots of uh, positive consequences as well. That they can support it and, you know, uh, contribute to development that way as well. Um, then of course there are lots of uh, people who would love to use uh, Blender who are more like occasional people who are not full-time 3D artists but they are maybe designers, they may be you know, um, other people who need to visualize something in 3D but Blender has had like a learning curve that resembled uh, more like a wall uh, for the longest time. It was more like you would open it up and how many of us have either ourselves or met people who told you like I opened up Blender 
I tried to select something, there was a ring that appeared wherever I clicked. Um, I it feel very uncomfortable and, um, you know, uh, not likely that I'm ever going to learn this. Um, so even some of these smaller, like, almost subjective um, uh, surface level things can make a big difference. Um, right. Um, yeah, and the other thing is with a slightly more well-defined uh, interface with some, some more guidelines, it should also become easier to extend in the future. So anyway, um, I'd like to go briefly through some of the progress we did. Um, of, of course, many of you probably be following along, but sometimes it's nice to have some explanations and it can help when we discuss things afterwards. So in a, in a lot of ways, I think this is maybe the biggest uh, user interface update we've ever done with Blender. The other one was 2.5, where we, we were involved in, in that process too. Um, but obviously, as Woody sh showed earlier, our good old friend. Um, <laughs> and this is uh, 2.79, which still looks a lot like what we did in 2.5. And this is uh, our progress so far in 2.8. Um, but it's just sometimes nice to look back just to see how, how many things have changed. Because things happen one by one, but it's, you forget that only a year ago we were in a very different place. <coughs> Uh, I'll just go briefly through some of the features. There's the, there's obviously the theme. This is the first thing you see, and the updated icons. Now the icons are now more like glyphs. They're designed to be um, more like text, more like glyphs that you can actually theme. So you can make sure they're always readable in a dark theme or a bright theme. And we've had this uh, wonderful icon designer who has spent countless hours, uh, you know, adjusting and drawing these tiny little uh, icons. And he's constantly listening to feedback and very, he's being very responsive to update them. And, you know, it's, it's really uh, a lot of work to go through all of those. So uh, I, don't know, I just want to thank uh, Andre and Ambrose. <laughs> 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 And, and obviously, uh, most of you probably know there's like a thread on Blender Artists where people are contributing a lot. And every, I really like them. Um, there's a good vibe. People have lots of suggestions and ideas. And we're still thinking and working on adding more color coding to uh, finding the best ways to do that. Uh, I can't remember what this was about. Uh, oh, yeah. This is more this is about the theme and the darker theme, the more subdued uh, colors is really sort of helps to make your uh, content pop a little bit. So it's, uh, you don't focus so much on the UI Chrome. We try to get that out of the way a bit and you know, make, make sure that uh, user-created content pops out of the screen more. Um, there's the popovers, um, trying to solve the issue where people would have all these little sub-editors open everywhere and they wouldn't have a lot of space left for their uh, user-made content. So this allows us to open something up, adjust something, and, and close it again without having it uh, always be present on the screen. Obviously, we have um, a pie menus now. And we try to ad adopt them in a consistent way. And pie menu is really interesting because they can be super fast. They can work almost like a gesture. And one of the really nice things about pie menus is you can sort of pack uh, several features into one keystroke. And this allows the user to only remember one keystroke for many features. And as you hold down the keystroke and drag in a certain direction, you can be pretty much as quick as just uh, tapping the key directly. And that allows us to make better use, more efficient use of our, our very precious uh, key, keyboard keys we never seem to have a free keys, and you know it's very full. Um, then there's the properties, of course, where we try to invent a more structured approach to visualizing the hierarchy, um, so that that part is always clear. Uh, previously, it wasn't really clear like which options related to each other when you had long lists of things. Um, so we tried to sort of uh, 
be a lot more strict and structured there, uh, which also should make it a lot easier for other people to contribute and extend. Obviously, we have the um, state indicators as well, which show when something is keyed, when something is animated, when something is driven, and also when something is overridden. Uh, we have different little indicators for that. Um, yeah, and then there's the workspaces that try to uh, help guide the user along the process of creating a, a 3D scene. This is sort of tries to be in the general order of a typical workflow where you start up basic uh, objects and uh, layouts, and then you can move on to modeling, sculpting, and so on. So this is sort of tries to have a certain uh, logical order to it. But obviously, you can uh, customize this however you want. Um, but the bigger goal, obviously, is making Blender more task-oriented. So when you switch uh, to the sculpting workspace, you're already in sculpt mode, and you can start, start sculpting. And with the uh, template that Brecht implemented, um, it makes it so that when you open up uh, your sculpting template directly, you can immediately start sculpting. And we expect that a lot, for a lot of users, this will be a lot really helpful because some people might want to just use Blender for sculpting, and it, it creates a way to directly uh, begin with this really quickly. The status bar, which allows, which is a way to help sort of communicate to users um, what happens when you click, basically. So depending on what tool you're using, different things will happen when you click, and this basically just helps uh, communicate that. Also, when you switch from right mouse select to left mouse select, things work slightly differently, and this will remind users um, exactly what happens in all situations. It's context sensitive, so when you hold down modify keys, it updates, and when you go to different editors, it updates too. So it's an always context sensitive uh, way to see what will happen, basically. Um, and then there's the tools. I won't show it, go too deeply into it, but you already saw the, uh, the active tools and the toolbar. Um, and yeah, just, just to say it's fairly flexible, it can be uh, extended. Um, and you can obviously add ons can add their own, which I'm very excited about. Um, right, uh, then we have some uh, other additions for more, li more sort of aimed at tablet users and also uh, beginners who would like a more visual, direct way to switch your viewports rather than having to use your keyboard. And obviously, if you have a tablet, and other some and some laptops, um, you have you might have no keyboard, or you may have a smaller keyboard. So this kind of thing is is useful as well for those uh, kinds of devices. Now, with the different um, with the new toolbar, we have kind of a different paradigm for what we call active tools versus commands. So for the longest time, we've had all these operators that um, act on whatever you have selected. But previously, we had this toolbar, which had a little bit of a haphazard, um, somewhat random a collection of operators. And now it's a bit more sort of structured. So the toolbar is wh where we have our active tools that stay active. And we have a lot more menus that are e more easily accessible now for all our commands. And the nice thing about this is it's, um, it's consistent so that in the menus, we, we always have access to all of them, and you don't have to just have a, a random uh, you know, selection of them. However, we do have a context-sensitive menu. Normally, you open it with the W key, but for left-click uh, select, we can use the right mouse button also to open it. So there's a nice, quick way to access the most usable, I mean, the most often used uh, commands, depending on the context there. We also have what's called the quick favorites, which is a way to add uh, commands that you may use uh, a lot in your own sort of custom menus, that menu that you can open with the Q uh, key as a, as a quick way to access certain commands. We have some new guidelines for like headers, so we try to uh, make use of hierarchy. On the left side, we have like the main mode thing, we have some menus, and then we have data blocks in the middle and some toggles on the right, so we try to be a bit more consistent about that. So anyway, this, that gives you a brief update on 2.8. Probably most of you know it, but it's good to just refresh it anyway. Um, I like to 
briefly go over the next uh, steps, things we're kind of thinking about working on, also things we're interested in getting feedback on. Um, I would really like to invite you to contribute as well. So one of them is improve support for left click select, but meaning um, basically we have a, an issue right now when you try to use the old F, uh, left click select where it's not really properly compatible with the active tools because if you switch the mouse buttons around, then you use the active tools with the other mouse, with the right mouse button, which seems very strange. And so we, we're working on improving the support for left click select. Once we have that, we have a very interesting discussion ahead of us, which is what should be the default. Um, but really, you could say that that comes after, after we've made it work well. Um, but obviously, if we were to change the default, uh, in Blender to be left click select, it would greatly change the sort of first impression and for people who just want to use it uh, occasionally. Also, people who use it in conjunction with other apps that obviously probably all use left click select. Many of you probably do not only use Blender in your workflow, you probably jump between several apps and having to adapt on such a basic level can be a challenge. In any case, um, we would keep a right click select also, but it's a discussion we have, a <laughs> you know. Uh, but it's, it's not a settled thing, and we have to keep discussing what makes the most sense. Obviously, we have users coming to Blender, new users, people who are excited about 2.8, and it's, you know, we have to think about everyone to, make, to try to, yeah, deal with it in a good way. We also have what I call the industry standard key map, but probably we'll rename it to the compatible key map which is just a way for people who are used to other 3D apps to more easily adopt Blender. There are some kind of um, conventions in, in many 3D apps where there are many uh, key, key uh, input things that are they all have in common. So you have the WER, cool, WER uh, keys for uh, translation, you have the F key to sort of focus your viewport, you have, there's a few other ones that a good chunk of them use and if we were to ship with such a key map it would make it a lot easier for uh, people to, uh, studios who already are used to a certain package to switch over to Blender. Um, then of course there's the asset manager which we've done some basic UI for and there's a lot of work technically also to make it work better but uh, I mean, all of this is public on developer.blender.org, but we want to make it work like a sort of database where you can sort of switch around and um, have it visible in your project and sort of drag in materials, drag in models, drag in textures and particles, and also drag them back into your uh, sort of asset uh, catalog. And uh, we expect this will really be a great addition, but we've done some user interface work as well on how to try to deal with this in a good way. Brushes is another one uh, that we're sort of thinking about a, a cleaner, smarter way to deal with tools versus brushes. So we could have a brush system where the little preview uh, updates to reflect your brush settings and that would make it a lot easier to switch brushes because you can see what it will look like and it will constantly update. Uh, obviously, we'd also like to keep working on the tool systems, like to add it, make it so that you can add tools using it. You can just drag in the 3D view to add add your uh, add your primitives. Uh, we have some other specific ones, like a bend tool, and uh, uh, another uh, topic um, that we're discussing also is uh, gizmos for modifiers. Um, but we need a system for that as well. Um, and there's obviously lots and lots of polishing and improving that could be done in lots of areas. There's a few other things. This is just like to, uh, what's it called, like include you in the process or things we talked about previously. Now we have this awesome feature where we can edit multiple objects in Blender. So you can have two objects selected, go into edit mode, and you can select both, and you can uh, edit both of them, but we probably need some improved uh, interface for actually switching them out once you're in edit mode there could be an easier way to say, um, I want to edit these two uh, guys, but now I want to switch it, up, switch it out with something else and edit these objects without having to exit and enter edit mode all the time. Um, and, and maybe an easier way to see 
which objects you're editing currently. So it's, it's a little bit unclear. Um, there's also the multi-properties editing. We have a way where you hold Alt and then you can drag on properties and it applies to multiple objects, but that would be nice to improve as well so you don't have to hold the Alt key, but in a consistent way. So, um, And then these, these are just other things that people are working on, like improved uh, uh, visual display in the dope sheet so you can see uh, the uh, what's it called the interpolation from between keyframes uh, in the dub sheet um, improving the clarity of the hierarchy and the properties so you can say so you can see the hierarchy more visually in different places and we have a lot of polishing work to do to make sure the alignment is a lot better uh, in our properties there are some panels that are not really um, you know all that great at the moment so we'd like to keep on improving that and polishing it uh, there's also the um, yeah, vertical header thing. Uh, so currently there isn't really space for all our uh, header tabs, but that will help. And, um, anyway, so those are the smaller things that pe different people are working on, and we're, we're sort of working towards those things. Then there are some bigger goals that are more like undefined, but I thought it would be nice to include you in the process and the kinds of things we're discussing, and we can open it up in a minute. One is is the uh, asset management, which is still a bit fuzzy. Like there are different um, uh, different types of asset managers we could include in Blender to make it so that you could directly add things from the cloud. So you can hook it up to a cloud storage system and directly add in your assets. Um, there's the uh, Blender 101 project, which is a little bit of a fuzzy project because every time you talk to someone, it it seems to mean something different, um, but uh, <laughs> but what uh, part of what it means is some of the things we already have actually, which is the um, the concept of templates. This is actually was added in 2.79 actually, but although many people don't know it, um, and it allows you to make a custom version of Blender that works differently, and so that can be quite powerful. Um, the other thing is the active tools, which allows uh, you to use Blender more visually. Um, so that's another part of it, you could say. Uh, and then one of the ideas is we could bake out a sp sort of more stripped down versions of Blender that are only meant to do specific tasks like a 3D printing app or like a baby children 3D app or a sculpting only app or something like this. Um, so. There's still a lot of design work to be done to actually implement that. And there's also a lot of conundrums about how to even handle it in a way that doesn't create lots of developer overhead and is manageable and all these things. Then there are like other bigger things, like we want there's some people who want to do uh, virtual reality interfaces. So you could uh, put on your headset and view your work or work on your uh, whatever you're doing with uh, VR goggles. Some other 3D apps have started to add this, so, and it obviously makes sense when you're creating spatial content anyway. But creating a user interface for VR is not an easy job, so it's a bit undefined. And obviously, uh, touch tablets as well, as well, how to make a Blender more usable without a keyboard. We've already gotten quite far with this, but it's interesting to keep thinking about. And for all those kinds of things, really sort of um, also uh, welcome proposals and how to try to solve this. Obviously, it needs development work, So, but even so. Um, then I'd like to also open it up a bit more and talk about uh, more broadly the way we handle user feedback and uh, the community-driven uh, project like Blender. Um, we have... Um, we have a few places. We have right-click select where people create uh, proposals. And we have a dev talk also where people have suggestions and comments. And it's really cool with Blender that it's a, an open community. And I mean, we really have a passionate user base. So we really, when we're working on Blender during the code quest, we really he hear from people loudly. And that's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very satisfying when you're working on something, even if people don't agree with you all the time. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really fun that uh, people uh, really care, and that's, a, I think, a good thing. You could say you know, that, we, that people have so much passion for it. And um, 
I just want to thank people for all the work they're doing to contribute, to comment, to, uh, you know, and so on. But um, yes, uh, obviously we would like to, to invite people to contribute, but a lot of things are really good ideas. We just don't know always or have enough power or uh, uh, resources to implement everything. Um, but I'd like to open it up now a bit more to sort of discuss how we can improve our, our process and our communication um, to uh, users to include people more, to have better guidelines, whatever it is. But um, yeah, do you, what do you guys? <laughs> um, we, we could ask users or, I mean, we, we could. Yeah, I, th I think uh, we want to hear from you now. Yeah. Like that's, uh, that's the whole point, right? Exactly to, right, yeah. So if you have any uh, questions or in, in general, like if you like the approach that we're going, if you have any proposals, and if it's it clear, especially uh, with so many changes, is it clear the direction? Uh, I know there is a roadmap somewhere, but it's always hard to find. Um, uh, some of the questions get repeated many times, so it's it clear. Uh, we tried this year, we try after the, during and after the cold quest, we try to um, improve the communication in terms of uh, like at least every feature that gets added gets explained on the Blender developers. YouTube channel, Twitter, and Facebook, we have now three, all three social media, major social media uh, covered uh, on the Blender development uh, side. At the beginning was a bit of a hard thing to decide, like should we should use the Blender channel, so should we make new ones? And it's so focused on development itself that we made new ones, but we want to hear from you. Uh, we read all the comments, <laughs> yes, we do, mm -hmm. and uh, it, especially on DevTalk and on the YouTube channels, on the YouTube videos, so we try to answer as, uh, as much as we can. Also, code.blender.org, but now there's so many <laughs> um, um, areas where you can give feedback that we want, is it clear enough? We want to know if it's clear or not. So uh, any questions regarding that communication first? Is it clear? <laughs> and we have a microphone here. All right. Um, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, hi, um, I'm Gianluca Vita. I'm, I'm a teacher in university and I teach to into diverse, different university to architects and to artists more and the problem with the students is ever this that they sorry for what i'm saying now they want to sketch up when they mm -hmm. when they start sorry for that okay mm, <laughs> don't kill okay. me they they want to sketch up uh, when they start uh, they open blender mm -hmm. and it seems that is uh, like a boeing the seven for seven uh, they are scared or oh, what? Not, I know that you know that, but I have 200 students every year, more or less. Mm. And uh, Blender is a wonderful software, and I think I'm not a so bad teacher, but at the end, we make this world, they make um, renderings and so, and, but at the end of the course, the most of them quit, and they go back to, to do other software. And, for me, it's very hard, you know? And I think that um, this is because there is a lot of buttons. Because we think as users, but normal people is lazy and normally stupid. So maybe they need less buttons. That is my, generally is my idea. But I have a question. Uh, you speak about the template. And uh, th this template is working for the 2.8 uh, to this system. And wh where can I find uh, uh, the, the information to work with this? Because I have an idea to make some experiment with, with this, uh, which I explained to you. How, how can I find the information to work uh, on, on the interface with this yes. template uh, and everything? I think Brecht okay. is a good person to answer the question. So the the Blender manual has a page on application templates, um, which you can find. But uh, at the moment, it's really quite technical. So basically, what the way you would create a template, you can create a startup Blend file, but if you really want to customize it, you're going to have to do Python scripting uh, at the moment. So you all, the end, most uh, of the Blender. Uh, so, so I'm not good in 
if I find one student that uses or two that make us thesis uh, using Python, how much time? It's very difficult, it's very complicated, or it's something that a normal yeah. student can manage for you? Because yeah. I ask that, yeah. uh, maybe a stupid question, because I'm totally mm -hmm. outside from... Uh, no, um, well, again, of course, it depends exactly what you want to create a template for, but I think at the moment it's not the easiest thing to do. It, it requires... A are there examples uh, of a temp template? Yeah, uh, there, there are examples. People have made s uh, alternate templates for Blender. There's a, a one that's fairly well known called Blender Pro that someone yeah. made. That's an example. But I, I think also talking about this, not only that the, the students go away because it's too hard, whatever. Um, I think it's a bit of outdated. I gave uh, my first 2.8 workshop two weeks ago to people that have never done 3D and they, they nail it. They just start using it right away. So I think um, not only speaking about the UI being hard, difficult, but also speaking about templates, it's a bit outdated now if we focus on 2.7 because 2.8 is a completely different uh, way to start approaching Blender. And the templates that we ship with to, to the animation VFX um, sculpting, they are a good example, right, to, to look at if we want to make new ones. So I think we uh, should look in 2.8 as a reference. Yeah, maybe. You can get and quite far with templates by just uh, shipping custom startup.blends, basically, because you can do an awful lot just by hiding panels, hiding windows. You don't need uh, setting up a nice workspace, and you can then save that as a template quite easily without any coding. So that's another approach uh, that you could take, yeah. So a question from... Um, a don developer perspective, uh, I would expect to have a um, consistent system f for messages coming from add-ons. Like first, there are messages like errors, warnings coming from add-ons. Second, um, progress, uh, progress messages coming from add-ons if there is some heavy task like um, building a large city composed of 10,000 buildings. I'd like to prefer to, to post message like building one is ready, building two is ready, and so on. Like heavy task and to have a progress message. I mean, there exists a system for operators to report messages and to display progress, but I think there's probably some limitations where if you have an operator that has to run for like a long time because it's slow, uh, it might be challenging to display good messages then. I think it's possible, but it's a little but, involved. Okay, it's possible with. Uh, like error or warning, but yeah. it's not possible, or it, uh, say it's quite messy to display a progress message for a heavy task. I, I think it is, but it might, I, 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 I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure there is an API for it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, about the Fuzzy Blender 101, uh, for the moment, do you know if it will be just a template of Blender? Like, uh, okay, uh, Blender is only one template, very simple. Uh, do you think it will become uh, like a separate uh, Blender, very different? Um, you mean, is it, how different will it be from normal Blender? Is that what your question is, or? Uh. Will it be just a template? Will it be 101? Would it be just a template, or would it be a whole different Blender? Uh, I mean, it's, it is a little bit fuzzy because part of Blender 101 is the fact that there is there are templates, <laughs> could you, you could say, and another part of it is the tool system and all that stuff. And uh, the thing we haven't done yet is sort of to f figure out if we are to, to ship a sort of super stripped down version of Blender, how exactly would it look? How different would it be from the regular version of Blender? There are some tr there are some tricky things with it because Blender's code and so on isn't really well set up to do this because things are very interdependent and it's we're already um, you know uh, uh, we're like you know limited for resources and if we have to uh, worry about two or three versions of Blender that work differently it can spread out the resources more thinly and we, Blender's already. So, 
say it again. Why should you do that? Create different versions of the blender. Difficult, of course, and also if you can create a template yeah. of a user interface, yeah. it should be already uh, in there for most of the people. You mean like the built-in so templates? Create a separate code base blender yeah. version. That's really difficult, of course. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's really different than creating a template. Well, the, okay. the slightly confusing thing is that templates uh, kind of uh, work on multiple levels, you could say. There's the kind of templates we already shipped that are basically just sort of uh, uh, layouts and Startup setups and modes. Yeah. There's another question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I think what you guys accomplished in the last few months is just plain amazing. I think you're doing a really good work there. And even, I mean, you... <laughs> You net, did not stop, you know, going on adding the remarks, what you already have given thought of. It's it's really good, and I think the interface is on a really really good way. There's just one uh, remark, yeah. one question I want to want to uh, ask. I think is um, you want to implement this new linking system and the the improved overrides. Mm -hmm. Will there be interfaces for it? Yes. Yeah. Ah, oh, awesome. So. Um, <laughs> Especially for the overrides, um, it would be important, I think, to sort them by type and by name, just to make sure that you can, for example, erase all the shading overrides as one at once and stuff. Yes. Oh, uh, that sounds really good. Yeah. And, <laughs> and okay, another little little question, if I'm already up in mic. <laughs> um, you have this awesome Python support. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. do everything by Python. And I just saw your quick menu you uh, you, you built in there. Is there a plan to make like custom user scripts that you can put to a button in, into this quick menu? So if I have written something that uh, works on whole of my selection and I want to use it over and over again, can I, is, is there a way plan to do something like you this? You mean, can you add, if you write your own add-on, can you add yourself into the uh, contextual menu? Uh, I'm sure, yeah, sure you can do that, but I mean just if you type a few lines of Python, like mm. drag it into a button, only to click it. Ah, like that. Yeah, uh, very quick, basically. R really dirty. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I don't fully understand the like question. If you write a little uh, snippet of Python, could you turn it into a button uh, in an easy way? I mean, right. you, currently you would have to make an operator, and if you go into the text editor and you go to like templates and you go Python operator, it has a very simple operator, and you can kind of drop your lines of code into that template, uh, into that, you know, of text, so that's currently how you would do it. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, the whole interface is defined in Python, so you can add yourself uh, more or less wherever you want. In fact, in 2.8 now, uh, add ons can also have custom editors as well, so you can have your own custom editor uh, defined in Python as an add on. Okay, this uh, sounds nice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, sorry for my English. It's uh, possible for think a uh, group of modifier or node system of modifier, some material on uh, I, uh, cube, triangulator, wireframe, and yes. uh, subsource of I, I mean, it's, it's yes. think possible. This is part of the Everything Nodes project that Jacques Luc is working on. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. Name group of, of list. Mm -hmm. uh, of like uh, basically modifier nodes, nodal modifiers. So that's on the roadmap, basically. You Two weeks, three weeks? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um. <laughs> but you'll have to, you can find Jacques Luc and ask him about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi. I, I, uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, I would like to know if uh, templates can change also handlers and uh, things that are not just uh, buttons and uh, and so on. Uh, so, I mean, uh, for example, if, uh, if I li would like to work on a template uh, for kids, uh, I would make uh, uh, come back the uh, small uh, widgets, the small arrows that let you move things or uh, change shapes or things like this, or add even uh, uh, simpler controls. So I would like to know if the templates can, uh, can do this, uh, or if you have to dip dive in, uh, inside the code base? I mean, for this kind of thing, if you want to create templates that really deeply change the UI, you have to be familiar with the Blender Python code. And if you are, you can 
do lots of changes. You can like you can do anything that an add-on can do, um, and you can add your own user preferences even. Um, so it's it's very flexible. It might be a little difficult, but you can you can do it. The short answer is yes, you can do those things, and you can sort it all out from Python and make your own tools that reference uh, gizmos, and you know. If you have enough knowledge and time, you can. There's almost no limit <laughs> to what you can do. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, the the second question, very quickly, is: uh, Is it right now possible to include a web page, a web web browser inside the not Blender? Sure. <laughs> uh, not easily. I mean, you could, you can do any kind of drawing uh, in various places. So if you very, you know, you want to do something very clever and, and load it from some external thing and draw it into Blender, you could, but it's uh, it's not easy. Um, and yeah, it's I wouldn't really advise doing it at the moment. <laughs> Hi, um, I've been following the discussion on um, on the interface on the the Dev Talk channel, and I saw I think someone was saying the search menu, you were going to add in some extra terms to help people find things that were named differently inside Blender. Um, I also was wondering, though, if you were going to look at the um, node editor um, search and the way you add nodes at the moment. Mm -hmm. I used animation nodes and noticed that it was very easy to, to add like a multiply node. Even though it's just using a math node, you, you can find the multiply. And when you add it, it sets up a math node as a multiply node, but in in cycles, it's a little bit more. You have to know that you need to add a math node, yes. and then manually set it up. Is, are there any plans to <coughs> make that easier? I mean, that sounds like a really good idea, basically. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not even so, sure how animation nodes is doing it. I'll have to talk to Jacques about <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, basically, that's obvious. That sounds like a good idea to have more fuzzy search or alternate search terms. Uh, so that, yeah, exactly right, as you say. Yeah, yeah or search on any menu. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, is any other question? We still have five minutes. We can There's rant about someone it. someone over there. Sorry, yes. Hello. Um, so thank you for your great work. Uh, and to everybody also, so this uh, front hall situation must us not let forget that a lot of people here are probably involved. Yes. Uh, and I want to start doing that too. I have an idea uh, because I found out about sculpting in virtual reality. I tried that and it's super intuitive. I'm overwhelmed by how good that is, in my opinion. And uh, I wanted to ask if somebody would want to join me in creating VR sculpting for Blender e or if anybody already uh, has done something. I found some add-ons for VR viewport. Okay, here you have one. And before I can mention Pepe Land, Daniel Martinez Lara, Gris Pencil, he is really into it. So talk to, it, talk to him and see uh, his presentation tomorrow. It's uh, related to that. Not a sculpting, but yeah. Okay. And I just can add that in the lightning talk, um, Jonas Tichel will, will give a talk. He comes from Leipzig from, from us, and uh -huh. he's working also on HTC Vive and sculpting. And he has really great results already and I think in general he's interested in if other people can join or help and what's the general interest as so you should see the lighting talk or just come to me Jonas and I Tichel. Jonas Tichel, yeah. Okay. Lighting talks are starting in like less than five minutes so okay. we maybe Any have time for one more or something probably. Yeah. But. Any other question? There. Two. Two. Okay. Very quickly you yeah. and them. Okay. Do you do you plan to um, to work on the stack modifier to to slice the modifier to drag them? Yeah, to drag them. Uh, that's something we want <laughs> we wanted to do for the longest time because it's very clumsy that you have to click these little arrows. The underlying issue is that Blender has a certain sort of custom UI toolkit, you could say, and it it wasn't really designed with dragging and dropping in mind originally. And so there's a bunch of places where it'd be nice to use drag and drop to reorder things and lists, reordering modifiers. Uh, lots of things would be nice to do uh, by just dragging rather than having these little buttons to click, 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 click. Um, so that w would be good, but it's not easy in the, the way Blender works currently. The other thing is we are working on um, 
or Jacques Luke is working on the uh, uh, nodal modifier system, so it may it may not be worth it to spend so much energy on the old stack modifier system if it's being replaced. But it could be useful anyway. This kind of dragging and dropping many places in Blender. So yes, it would be good. But uh, and yeah. the last one. Last. Okay, I'll, I'll skip the the longer parts. First of all, thanks for no num button arrows. The absence was very nice. No number arrows. Yes, num button arrows. The uh, arrows that teach you on every button that you can go, that you can decrease or increase them. They weren't there oh, anymore. Right, right, so right. I like that very okay. much. Yeah. <laughs> um, has it been considered to make MMB the default for panning? Because on every two, 2D screen mm. uh, editor in Blender, you use middle mouse button for panning, and in every other application you use middle mouse button for panning. I have a script to, to switch it and I'm comfortable for 15 years now to switch it, but mm. I think it would be more consistent and That's use true. shift MMB for yeah. rotating. And especially if you're using uh, grease pencil and 2D work, you probably want to uh, not accidentally uh, orbit your view. Yeah, I mean, it's I think a, that it's, should be done, yeah. It's a reasonable idea, yeah. but it's Obviously, a muscle memory, those kind of basic changes in Blender. Uh, not that we can't do them, obviously we can, but we just have to be a bit... <laughs> we changed spacebar. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. <laughs> we could yeah. do this yeah, one, yeah. too. So, I, I mean, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, it, you know, yeah. We it's a reasonable idea. Yeah. So anyway, I would like to just close out briefly by saying, uh, you know, thank you to all the developers who've been working on this, and thank you to all of you for listening and also for contributing and and I want you to invite you to keep on commenting, contributing, creating proposals, and also especially for more developers to come on board to help out with the user interface. And you know, there's really an opportunity to uh, make some a big dent in the universe by improving the <laughs> Blender interface. So I hope to. Thank you. So, uh, to present SketchUp, it's...